that I got married, 1982 for, for you old, for you youngins. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Let, let me open up in prayer. I don't, I don't want to quench the spirit, and I won't be before you long, but I do want to share what the Lord has laid on my heart. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you. We thank you for being able to be a vessel. I thank you for being a vessel, and, and Lord, I thank you for waking me up and, 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 and leading me out to do your work, to do your way. So use me, Lord, and, and prepare the hearts of those that would hear that no matter how small or how large, Lord, that your word, your spirit would impact their heart and build them up to be the children, men, and women of God that you are called for to be. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, Pentecost. I want to touch on a, a familiar passage of scripture in Acts, the second chapter. And then I want to share out of Philippians, uh, the fourth chapter, verse 8. So, Acts, the second chapter, I'm going to read a portion of scripture. I want to lift out the essence of what the Lord laid on my heart with regard to Pentecost, what it meant then, but ultimately what it means to us today. So Acts the second chapter in the King James Version reads as this. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like fire and it sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost and they were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews devout men out of every nation under heaven and when this was noised abroad the multitude came together and were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own language and they were all amazed and marveled saying one to another behold are not all these which speak Galileans and how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes Cretes and Arabians we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful words of God and they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others, mocking, said, These men are full of wine. These men are full of wine. And then Peter steps forth. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall see dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens will I will pour out these I will pour out those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned unto darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Everyone, whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I just want to park in Pentecost for a minute, and then I want to bring us to today. So they were 
all with one accord and, on one, and in one place. So then they had to be on one accord and in one place. They weren't all the same people, but they all were connected to one God, one spirit. And in the unity of that spirit, they were on one accord. So that all the petty little things that they had going on in their different lives were all superseded by the unity of the spirit, them being called to one God and being unified. So they had something that was able to overcome. And that's really important. They had a connection to the God and the spirit that was help them to overcome all the differences that they had in their life. They were different people, different circumstances, different situations. That's something that was true then and is true now. Amen. We still have access to that resurrected power. We still have the ability to unite around one spirit, one God, and be unified as one, on one accord. Amen. Amen. So I want to skip down to verse 17 before we move over to the Philippians 4.8. Because I have a short message and I just want to give you the, the, the pieces that, that God gave me. And then you take them and let them minister to you between now and the next time the Lord says we come together. Amen. So in verse 17, after Peter had stood up, stood up to clarify, he reiterated the words of Joel in the second chapter, verses 28 through 22, and said... And it shall come to pass. So remember, on one accord in one place, then it shall come to pass in these last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall see dreams, and on the servants and my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. That's what we want to hold from Acts and pull it into our observations and examination of Philippians 4.8. And if I had to have a title for this, it would be, what's, what's your daily Pentecost? Hmm. Because Pentecost wasn't just so they could have, so we could read about it and see how Peter came and the Spirit came and people were added to the church. That just wasn't for them, them then. That's for us now. Mm -hmm. And what I'm submitting is that it's for us individually and collectively. Because we need to have a daily Pentecost. And so I ask the Lord because I'm in the same situation as some people. I don't have an idea about how things are going to go. I don't know how, where God is moving all the time. I might be tired of situations that are going on in the, in the house or at work or wherever. We all got circumstances and situations that we deal with that may distract us from the unity of the spirit, the one God, and being, and being connected in, in a powerful way so that we have access to to the spirit as Reverend Marcy mentioned earlier today so that the spirit is filling us and we're just overflowing with love and we're overflowing with the ability to deal with issues. We're overflowing with the ability to connect people to the Lord and then connect them to us in real authentic relationship. Not some fake Snapchat text relationship but a relationship where I can sit down eye to eye and talk man to man or man to woman or woman to woman and we can deal with deep issues of life. We can deal with the sorrows that come upon us. We can deal with the issues in our community. We can deal with our children. We can deal with what they're dealing with in school. We can deal with what they're dealing with in these streets. We have some depth in our, in our body. We have some strength and stability in us because we connected to the one God who created us all, can sustain us all, and has access to the wisdom and understanding that we need to make good decisions today so that we not burn up. I know that's a recurring theme. Whenever I preach, I'm always talking about being burnt up, walking down burnt up street. You know, I'm not talking about being lit. I'm talking about being burnt up when you just not what you need to be. You're not where God has for you to be. You're not doing what God has told you to do. You kind of say, uh, I don't even want to hear God. I'm going to do things my own way. I can go my own way. It's a very popular sound song, so millions of records. But going your own way can lead you straight to hell. So I'm just trying to keep it real, be 100 with you for a minute. And then I'm going to get out the way, and then you can let God minister to you through the Holy Spirit. So, daily Pentecost. So I ask the Lord, because I'm going through too, like everybody else. I'm going through trials, tribulations, situations, etc. Amen. Amen. 
I say, Lord, okay, that was then. What about me now? Amen. And the Lord said, well, you need to have a daily Pentecost. I said, well, how do I do that, Lord? He said, well, well, you know what you need to do, and I want you to share this with the people. You need to get some attitude food. Because some people, myself included, have a bad attitude about things. You fill in the blank, because everybody got it. Something I was disappointed about, something that's discouraging me, something I want that I ain't got, something that somebody else wants that I want, Lord help me. Everybody has something that, is the, that, that, that impacts their attitude, that impacts their outlook, that impacts their ability to connect to the Lord, that impacts their ability even to connect to people. Sometimes people's attitude will just will, will, a lot, will make them go into a shell where they won't even connect, communicate with people at all, in any kind of way. And I, I was jokingly talking about texting and Snapchat, and those have, a, those have a place, you know, in life. But there's some deep things that we got to deal with sometimes that you don't deal with on a text. You don't Snapchat. You ain't Facebooking it. You know, a, a rapper, Andy Mineo, said, why don't you face your problems instead of Facebooking them? <laughs> Real. There's certain things that electronic media just does not do well. And the deeper, meatier things of life and of God, I don't want to try to, you know, send you a 40-page 40, a 40 text about what the Lord is showing me and how he's dealing with me and the emotions I'm going through and all that. I'm. My wife coined a new term recently called, I need you to adult. A-D-U-L-T. I was like, oh, that's a new way of saying grow up. I'm going to need you to grow up. I'm going to need you to move beyond the 8th, ninth grade, 6, 7 year old approach to life where if you don't get what you want, you're going to cry, take your ball, run away, turn your back on somebody or something because you don't want to deal with it. It's time to adult. And so when I asked the Lord, okay, Lord, what do I need? What, you know, what, what is this all about? What, you know, how do I deal with this? He said, well, why don't you get some attitude food? And he directed me to Philippians 4, the 8th chapter. Excuse me. Philippians 4, the 8th verse. Amen. And I was like, okay, yeah, I've heard, I've, I've seen that. Let me, what, what are you trying to show me? What, 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 what is it that, that you're trying to share with me? What is it that is important about these, these, these passages of Scripture? What is it that, that I need to get out of this that's going to help me be an adult? That's going to help me have a daily Pentecost? That's going to help me get an infilling of the Spirit so much so that I'm able to connect to you and be able to overcome all the little things that are trying to distract me, get me burned up, move me out of my square, Move me away from where I need to be as a man of God, a woman of God, a child of God, a teenager of God. Whatever it is where you are, wherever God has you, he has an anchor for you and he has some words for you. So, Philippians 4 and 8 reads, finally. So when somebody says finally, they kind of bottom line. They go, look, this is the bottom line. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true Whatsoever things are honest. I'm going to go through all of them, but I just want to couple those together. Sometimes we're dealing with situations because we believe a lie. We believe a lie that somebody told us. We believe a lie that we read. We believe a lie that we heard coming up in our, in our, in our um, in own home environment. We might believe a lie that somebody is trying to you know, throw at you. We might even believe a lie of your own thinking. Sometimes we think lies and we believe them. So God said, well, if you want some attitude food on a daily basis, you need to really kind of tease out what's true. Kind of rely on what I told you in terms of who created you, in terms of my son Jesus Christ being the, 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 the resurrected son of God, in terms of the Holy Spirit being the one that should guide your decisions and provide for you the truth about who you are as an heir to the kingdom of God and all of the benefits that go along with that, one of which is being able to reach out for wisdom and truth and understanding, just like it says in James, that if I don't know, I know where to go. I don't know, I know where to go. I don't know, Jesus help me. I don't know, but I know where to go. Amen. I don't know, but I know where to go so that I can start feeding my attitude some truth. 
Because if I'm heir to a king, then I'm not going to worry about Johnny saying that I ain't nothing. Or Sally saying that, oh, I thought you was this, but now I see you that. Or somebody trying to manipulate my thoughts, my feelings, my, you know, different, my psychological makeup, trying to deal with me, you know, dealing with me on a professional level. Anything that we can think of, God has an answer in his truth. And his spirit is the one that will give us the honesty that we need. Amen. Now, you also may be able to get some honesty for some people, people of God. Because you may need to go to somebody and say, you know what, I need to understand how did I come across yesterday? Or how did that make you feel when I said this? Or what did you think about how we worked with that group? You have to be transparent enough to get some honest feedback from others and not take it as, oh, they told me I talk too much, therefore I talk too much. And I just go into my home and I'm just, uh, ugh. <laughs> no. Honest feedback from a man, woman, or child of God it's really to help you. Because I did get some feedback one time. This was in an entirely different situation. Somebody was like, yeah, you know what? You talk so much that I forget exactly what your point is. I was like, oh, so maybe I need to think about what I need to say so I can get the point out <laughs> before people get tired of listening to me talking. Amen. Honest feedback. Now I could have went into a hole and said, see, they just hate me. <laughs> and we do that. We pick and choose. Oh, they just hate me. They don't want me to have no fun. You know, and I used to think that, I'm going to be honest with you. When my mother used to say, I used to come in with the streetlights, I'm like, man, what's wrong with her? Shoot, I want to, everything happen when the streetlights start, when they start flickering and then everybody coming out, we playing hide and go seat, throwing crap apples at people and having fun in the street and stuff like that. That's when everything pop off. Why is she trying to hate on me? Amen. But we still do it when we grow. Somebody come and say, hey, you know what? You might want to try to, you know, brother, you might want to check out this, you know, your clothes is looking a little, eh. you know, maybe I can help you out with something. You know, why are you hating? Or people come to you and they always got to, you know, they got, I shouldn't say always. Sometimes people come to you, I know at least they come to me. And they say, man, why don't you hook me up? I'm always a little leery when somebody say, can you hook me up? I'm giving them a sign. I'm like, what are they asking me to do? Because I can almost see that this is going to be a little shady. And so we got to be careful and we got to deal with the honest truth of things. First and foremost, whatever the Holy Spirit is telling you, you need to go ahead and follow that. And if a man or woman of God is, is trying, to, trying to share with you a way to, 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 to um, you know, grow and develop, you know, take it as... They love you because just like God corrects who he loves. Now, people aren't perfect, but there are people that will honestly try to help you grow and develop. Amen. So, that's attitude food. Some truth and some honesty. Now, as we go further down into Philippians 4, 8, it says, whatsoever things are just. Now, I have to admit, when I first read this as a young man, I was like, just, just what? I mean, I didn't really, I didn't really quite capture the full meaning of just and justice and fairness, etc. Now I live in that world where I look at everything I see, I'm like, man, that's not fair. That's not, um, that's injustice. That's, that's inequity. You know, I see health inequities and health disparities. I see in the neighborhoods different um, uh, areas that have been just devastated by the fact that banks won't lend, you know, I, I've seen examples of how you know our federal government, after the after the um, military men went away to war in World War II, they came back. They had this thing called the GI Bill, where you know you could go and get a loan to buy a house. You know, for a time, black people couldn't even get access to those loans. Um, you know, there's just so many things, social injustice. You know, we got school systems that are underfunded. You know teachers that are underpaid and, and billionaires that are just like, well, you know, I don't really think we need to have, you know, a budget at this time because I've got a real issue over here with this. While social services and, 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 and educational services, et cetera, are suffering. So I get it, you know, that there's lots of injustice. And so my point is this, I don't want all that injustice to feed my attitude. My attitude food has to come from what's just. And as I was sharing earlier, I'm always looking for something that is right. Where is the silver lining? Who is doing something that's positive? 
who is trying to address all these in injustices? What are the organizations and people that actually do love people and want to do something against or do something that's going to help people in housing or in education or, or finance or, or from a spiritual perspective? And who is really taking a, a good look at what's going on in the church to make sure that all of the people that come to the church have an opportunity to connect with the Lord and live out their gifts and talents? How are they being enabled to do the things that God has called for them to do? All the gifts and talents. How are they also being able to utilize those to their highest capability? Amen. Yeah. So I'm going to feed my, my attitude with some justice. I'm going to feed my attitude with the things that are going good. I'm going to feed my attitude with what's true and honest and just. And what some other things are pure. So I'm not going to go through a laundry list of the things that are not pure that we can see or hear or touch, <laughs> depending on where your head is at. But the fact is that a lot of purity, there is purity in the world. Always going back to the Lord in terms of his pure, unadulterated truth and his example and guidelines for how to live a pure life and his example and, and, and guidelines on how to, how to even resurrect your life when you didn't wreck it. Amen. Because no matter where you've been, you know, God still has a way for you to make it right. God still has a way for you to live a pure life. You can, you know, you can have done this, that, and the other and say, you know what? That was then. This is now. I'm not doing this substance. I'm not dealing with these people. And I'm not even thinking about doing the things that would be impure. Because God has given me a guideline, a roadmap, a book that I can follow and people around me that will help me to remain pure. So I'm gonna strive for that because that's the attitude food that I need. Because if I don't, then I will run down the rabbit hole of being subject and, 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 and have a poor attitude about life and the possibilities without God. Amen. So whatever things are lovely. So sometimes you really have to actually go back to basics. You should not necessarily rely on all your senses, what you see, hear, feel, and touch. Those are not gods. And the things that you can see, feel, hear, and touch are not gods. At the same time, you can look at the lovely things that God has created. Amen. God, I mean, I, I just use myself as an example. I remember as a child looking at the sky, I was like, wow, it is so expansive. Look at them clouds. Look at these trees. Look at, look at what God has done. Even people, to a certain extent, <laughs> admire from afar. I'm not, I'm not advocating lust. I'm not advocating any type of improper, um, um, undue, um, improper affection or anything like that. But if you really think about who God created and you look for the beauty in people and see it as God, then you have the right perspective. I can say, wow, God bless Reverend Marcy. God bless Tim. God bless, you know, Terrence. And I can see how God has blessed them, and that is lovely. Not, I see, I want, I want to take. Amen. We're not talking about coveting. But meditating on what God has done, that's good. Amen. So that your attitude is fed with the goodness of God. And you are able to deal with the issues because everybody's going to have them. I know I'm not alone dealing with issues. Amen. Moving forward, I only got three more to go and then we're going to have an altar call. Whatever is of good report, sometimes you need to make, let me rephrase that, you need to make decisions about what you take in. What, what is being reported to you through media, all types, through people, all people, you need to focus on some things that are of a good report that is positive. Not that there's nothing negative. There's going to be enough of that. You know, I remember a long time ago, well, I'll leave that example for later. You need to focus on a good report. But actually, just, just to be clear, what I was thinking about is I try for like my, my children. Um, I, I, I learned a lot of language in my earlier years 
that I don't necessarily use now, that I don't use now. And I do remember how a little bit my parents used to be like, they would try to shield me from the drama of the streets or the language and drugs and gangs and all these other kind of things because they knew ultimately later on, because I'm a grow up, if I, the Lord let me live, I'm going to see all that. So they didn't need to feed that to me, is basically what I'm saying. And similarly, I'm not trying to feed my kids on like how to curse and all this other kind of stuff that I learned as a child, you know, ever forbid it. I'm not trying to feed that to them, but I know they're going to be exposed to it if they live. They're going to hear it in music, they're going to see it on TV, their friends going to do it. So I know that that's going to happen. So I need to make decisions on providing an environment that has a good report. Well, you know what? My daddy ain't cursing all the time. He not cursing me out. He ain't cursing other people out. He ain't showing me how to curse. He's trying to do something or create an environment where I can learn and then the kids will have a good report. Same thing for us. We need to make decisions on how to have a good report in our lives. So I get a little bit of news and then I look at some good news and then I might talk to some people that are about the good news of God. What's God doing for your family? What's God doing in your life? What's God doing? How do you see him showing up in different areas? So if you have something of good report, because ultimately, and I'm going down to the next one, virtue. What are the things that really are representative of God's character in life? You know, it's connected to good report. It's connected to people who are living a life of God. But it's really living out the characteristics that God would say, that's a virtuous woman, or that's a virtuous man, or they are working on um, an altruistic, they're doing something that is, that is purely for the benefit of others. They're doing things out of their goodness, out of a, out of a, out of a, of a heart of love, that is not about them, but it's all about other people. Amen. So think about those virtuous things. Amen. So that you have some good attitude food. Because I'm telling you, if your attitude is not fed with the right stuff, it's going to go down. And it's going to limit your ability to ultimately get as much of God's infilling in his spirit as possible. And the last thing I'll touch on before the altar call is, um, if anything is praiseworthy. Let's think on these things. Let's think on these things. Let's dwell on something good. My father used to say, he used to say, when, when me and my sisters used to get a little rambunctious, he used to say, if you ain't got nothing good to say, shut up. Just shut up. Because we would just go at it. You know, and, and, and I get it. You know, we live in a society where we're constantly responding to stuff. We're responding to the media. We're responding to people. We're responding to a number of things. And oftentimes, we can see a lot of negative stuff in it, and then we can get a little cynical and be like, man, you know, ain't nothing good happening. Or, you know, um, or you get into this lane of, you know, be honest, people get into this lane of, that's them. Look at them. Look at them and what they're doing. That's horrible. That's horrible. As if they are so much better. But their life is consumed by talking about somebody else and what they ain't got. They're talking about a deficit. They're talking about something that is not necessarily praiseworthy. So I'm saying flip that. Feed your attitude. Get, get, get some good, praiseworthy, you know, look for the praiseworthy stuff and let that feed you because you will need it. Amen. Trust me, you will need to feed your attitude so that God can continue to feed you and Amen. fill you. That's what I have to share so that hopefully one or two seconds of this will be able to help you have your daily Pentecost that you get yourself in a position, get your attitude in a position where you are ready to be fed by God. You're ready to hear the truth of God. You're ready to be honest. You're ready to, to, to see the lovely things. You're ready to, 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 to look for the good reports and praise those good reports because then you become an engine of holiness. You become a, 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 a conduit of God's spirit and, 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 and be able to, to share with others in a way that's going to make a difference in their lives. Because they're going to get a lot of garbage and crap in the street any old kind of way. We want to make sure that our attitude is fed and that we're able to be filled by the Holy Spirit so that every day is just a, a, a Pentecost for us. And we might not draw 3,000, but if you draw one, 
Amen. If you help one person see the light, see God, one person be able to not take the handful of pills, one person say, I'm not going to cut myself, one person say, I'm not going to quit going to school, one person say, I'm not going to slap, I'm not going to shoot, I'm not going to do this or that or the other. That is a blessing Amen. in and of itself. Amen. Amen. Stand if you can.